All right, let's move into Genesis 2. I uh, just made the video for Genesis 1 a little bit ago. I went and had dinner. I'm back now, and let's do Genesis 2. This should be a uh, relatively uh, shorter video than the first one. I'm not going to bother with all the intro stuff that I did for like 14 minutes. I'll just get right into the chapter now. Now, like I said at the end of the last video, this is a second telling of day six, what happened in chapter one for day six. But day, day six in chapter one was just a brief overview of what happened with creating um, Adam and Eve, creating humanity, telling them to uh, be fruitful and multiply and having dominion over the earth and all of that um, basic stuff uh, for, uh, for the, the concept of the six-day creation in chapter one. Here in chapter two, we're going to go back in time and tell a, a more detailed version of the same story. Okay, It is not a second creation of a second Adam or anything like that. That's, that teaching is out there in the world, and it's not true. These are both telling the same story. This one is just a closer, focused-in uh, version of it with the, with the details. And we're going to start with uh, the seventh day here at the beginning. Genesis 2, verse 1 through 3. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the that that just means uh, everything that's in them, everything in the heavens and the earth. Um, and on the seventh day, God ended His work which He had made, and He rested on the seventh day from all the work which He had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it He had rested from all His work which God created and made. Uh, before I start this, um, did God need to rest? Um, is he finite like that? Did he have some sort of need to recover from the work that he had done? Um, there was strain on his body from all the heavy lifting, and he had to take a breather and, and recover and go sleep for a while or something. No, that's... This is actually set up as a pattern for humanity to follow when we eventually get to the Sabbath. So God did not require rest because he was out of energy or anything silly like that. God, an, 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 an infinite God would not uh, suffer from something like that. Um, but when we get to the Sabbath, that's, that's what this is ultimately referring to. Okay, did you know that the seven-day work week is our only measure of time that's not based on astronomy? Days, months, and years are calculated by the movement of the earth or moon, but there is no scientific basis for a seven-day week. Where did it come from? It came from God. Several times throughout history, some countries tried to use a different week of five to ten days, but they always came back to the seven-day week eventually. Just one more piece of evidence that the Bible's creation story is true. This will be the basis for the fourth commandment given to Moses to rest on the seventh-day Sabbath. But it's also a prophecy. We've currently had approximately 6,000 years of history, and the Bible speaks about a 1,000-year millennial reign of Christ when he returns. There are two verses in the Bible that claim a day equals, or a day is as, 1,000 years. If this pattern holds true, the millennium should begin during our lifetime. Amen. I'm looking forward to it. Um, so the, people tend to use that day as a thousand years uh, passage, which happens twice, 
in the Old Testament. No, once it's in the Old Testament, uh, it's in one of the Psalms, right? And then the second one was uh, quoted by Peter. And um, people tend to use that as some sort of a proof that the earth is really old, because a day is not a literal 24-hour day. A day is actually a thousand years. So they'll, they'll turn the six days of creation into 6,000 years. Or worse yet, they'll turn it into six billion years or something like that, which that doesn't make sense. If a day is as a thousand years, why are you turning it into billions now? It doesn't make sense. But that's not what the verse is actually referring to. This is what it's referring to. The, um, the time frame of God's plan on this planet is a 7,000 year plan. The whole point of this earth, the meaning of life, is God is got 7,000 years invested in this planet. He created it 6,000 years ago. After 15, uh, no, it was 16. After 1656 years, the flood came. And then after 300 and some years or whatever, um, Abraham was called. And then 2,000 years after Abraham was Jesus. And 2,000 years after Jesus, here we are today. So that's 6,000 years of human history, according to the Bible. And that's equivalent, so to speak, according to these verses, to six days. And, of course, the Bible talks about when Jesus comes back, he will rule on this planet for 1,000 years, which would be the seventh day, which mirrors the Sabbath concept. There was 6,000 years of work, that's six days, and then there's a 1,000-year uh, reign with Christ. And... We're not going to have to get up to an alarm clock and go to work so that we can feed our family during the millennium. Okay, it's not a time of work during the millennium. Therefore, it's our Sabbath rest, our, uh, a time of rest during, during that millennial reign. So that's the pattern that matches here. Uh, and I firmly believe that that's what it's actually talking about. 6,000 years of human history then 1,000 years of the Christ reigning during the millennium, and there's your seven days. And then there's a new heaven and a new earth after this one, and that's uh, another conversation for another time. Okay, moving on. Genesis 2, verses 4 through 6. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created, in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. And every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew. For the day, uh, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. But there went up a mist from the earth that watered the whole face of the ground. So this wraps up the seven day creation story. The chapter divisions. The chapter division could have gone here. Don't expect all the chapter divisions to make sense. Always consider what comes before or after a chapter division to be sure about context. A lot of people teach that all the chapter and verse numberings are only man's doing. I disagree. In the King James Bible, I believe God intended for each word, number, and even punctuation mark to be there. That includes the chapter numbers, the chapter verses, um, the chapter divisions. I believe God had his hand in all of that stuff. Um, we get an interesting tidbit of extra scientific data here as well. It seems rain never happened back then, and farming wasn't required because weeds didn't exist yet. This is ultimately addressing a primary weakness of a human, our need to eat. It's funny, I just had dinner right before making this video. Perpetual food that, uh, that doesn't require work to produce is why the Garden of Eden was special. Some say it never rained 
only in the Garden of Eden, but others think it never rained at all until after Noah's flood, and that's what I believe. Now, that can't really be proven from just this one verse. Um, the, the verse is unfortunately a little bit uh, ambiguous, I think is the right word to use there. Um, so we, we, we can't know this for sure. But Noah preached to everyone that it would rain, and nobody believed him. If they had never seen rain before, that would make more sense. So it, it makes sense that rain was not a um, normal activity before the flood. The, the, the Earth's ecology, is that the word I want? Um, before the, the flood was much different than it became after the flood. So um, having a different kind of atmosphere before the flood, um, including no rainbows, which that's Genesis 9, uh, would make sense that it never rained. So, you know, when the people are hearing Noah preach that it's going to rain and flood, they're like, uh, we have no idea what you're talking about, crazy man. And nobody went on the ark with him, other than his family. Genesis 2, 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Now we begin the detailed look at what happened on day 6. We physically come from the earth. Our breathing comes from God. This addresses another primary weakness of a human, our need to breathe. Nobody can fast from breathing. <laughs> I find that a little funny. I wrote that years ago. <laughs> I make myself chuckle there. Uh, Genesis 2, verse 8 and 9. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Free food all around. And now we have a new tree called the tree of life in the middle of the Garden of Eden. Eating from this tree will give you eternal life. But we also have another new tree, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. This will be the tree that Adam and Eve eat from in the next chapter. Do I want to expand very much on this right now? I'll probably end up doing it more in the next chapter, in 3, when they actually eat from it. Um, at, at this point, they had no idea Actually, I shouldn't say they. He, Adam, is the only person in existence here. Adam had no idea what evil even was yet. Um, I mean, he's only a few minutes old, so to speak. So he had no idea what, what it even meant to disobey God yet. Um, it would take time for that possibility to come around. But these are, the, these are the instruments which God is going to use to ultimately test Adam. And he knew what was going to happen, of course. God knew what Adam was going to do. It's all part of God's plan. He knew Adam would sin. That's what gets the whole process started in the 7,000-year plan. More about that in chapter 3, I guess. Genesis 2, verse 10 through 14. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden. And from thence it was parted and became into four heads. The name of the first is Pison. That is it which compasseth the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. I don't know that there's such thing as bad gold. <laughs> there is bdellium and the onyx stone. And the name of the second river is Gihon. 
The same is it that compasseth the whole land of Ethiopia. And the name of the third river is Hidakel. That is it which goeth toward the east of Assyria. And the fourth river is Euphrates. The Euphrates is the only river we can really identify here, but there is no guarantee that it's the same Euphrates we see today. The reason I say this is because Noah's flood could have completely changed the geography. It probably is the same river, but we just can't be certain. So looking back on this, Ethiopia, that's a known country today. The rest of these, we don't know. Um, Assyria, we know what Assyria is, biblically speaking, but there is no Assyria today. There is a country called Syria, but that's not exactly the same thing. Um, it's kind of the same area, but not really exactly the same thing. Um, Hittikel, no idea. Gihon, no idea. Havala, no idea. Pison, don't know. Um, these are all ancient things that don't, uh, that aren't known today. They either don't exist anymore, or they have been renamed. Okay, so this one here, the same is it that compasseth the whole land of Ethiopia. That's obviously an African nation. So the second river, Gihon, um, what is that? Is that the... Um, the Red Sea. Now it's the Red Sea. It used to be just a river, and now it's the Red... No idea. I'm just speculating here. But uh, the Euphrates is a river in, you know, goes through Iraq. Um, that's the only one by name that we recognize here today. Um, and of course, you know, it's been speculated. I know Ken Ham from Ensis and Genesis says this, that uh, it's quite possible that the rivers that we call Euphrates today or any of this other, any of these other lands, Ethiopia, they might be completely different. Uh, who knows? The Garden of Eden couldn't have could have been Greenland for all we know, or uh, Antarctica for all we know. We 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 don't really know it for sure, but it probably is the same, but we don't really know for sure. Genesis two verse fifteen through seventeen, and the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that shalt thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die." Did, did Adam even know what it meant to die yet? Adam's only command was to abstain from eating the fruit of one particular tree. This is the first mention, the first mentioning of death, and it comes as a result of breaking a single law. Adam could have lived forever in the Garden of Eden if he didn't eat that fruit, theoretically speaking. But of course, that wasn't God's plan. God didn't expect him to never ever sin and just live indefinitely, uh, f f literally forever. That wasn't, God knew that he would eat eventually. Genesis 2, 18. And the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. Amen. I have uh, quoted that verse uh, many times. I will make him and help meet for him. Let's talk about that right there. I don't know if my paragraph is going to say this, but people don't understand this word meet in the King James English. All right. I will make him and help a helper that is suitable for him. That's what this word meet means. So when you hear somebody say, yeah, she's my help meet, they don't understand 
what the word meat really means there. And so I'm trying to help you get out of that trap. A wife is not a help meet. A wife is a helper. She is a help who is suitable for you, who is meat for you. Adam at this point is still undivided. I said that in the first uh, chapter in, Ge in Genesis 1. He, he was one creation that had not been, his rib had not been taken out yet to, to form Eve. Companionship is addressed. We all need help. Amen. The role of a woman originates here as a companion and helper of man, while in parallel, man is created to be a companion and helper of God. Um, this I like to call a prophetic parallel. All right, there's a bunch of them all throughout Scripture where there's some sort of a physical thing that mirrors a spiritual truth as well. And this is, well, I don't know, I don't know if I can say that this is the first one. I've probably missed some in the previous verses going back to Genesis 1-1. But this is the first one that I'm bringing up, I guess. That the, the concept of a woman being a helper to a man, a wife being a helper to a husband, is the same parallel as a human, whether man or woman, a human being a helper to God. Those are parallel concepts. Um, there is a Ark of the Covenant in heaven. What does it look like? I have no idea. But uh, I think Revelation uh, explains that there is, or claims that there is a um, an Ark in God's heaven. And so God told Moses to manufacture, to create a physical one for the Israelites. And I get a lot of people who say, I thought the ark is in heaven, because where did Moses' ark go? Well, it went to heaven. No, the one that Moses built was a copy of the real one in heaven. So there's a prophetic parallel there. There's, you know, as we go through the scriptures, we will find more of these prophetic parallels. Um, Noah's Ark is a prophetic parallel of Jesus Christ. If we are in Christ, we will be saved from the wrath of the flood. Okay, the wrath of God. Okay, so that's a parallel. Genesis 2, verse 19 and 20. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air, and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle, and to, all, and to the fowl of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found an help meet for him. <laughs> um, God is letting Adam check out all of these animals to see if any of them would be appropriate to be a wife. Bestiality, a weird concept going on here. And, of course, none of them were suitable. None of them were meat, because animals are not suitable for humans to reproduce and all of that. And bestiality is obviously outlawed in the Law of Moses um, many chapters later from now. So it seems silly, but that's, that's what's going on here. None of them were found and help meet for him. Therefore, uh, God had to create a human wife. God has Adam give names to all the animals. 
none of the animals qualify as a suitable helper for Adam, so God needs to divide Adam into two to produce Eve. This stresses the distinction between humans made in the image of God and the entire animal kingdom. No animal is on the same level as a human. Take that, Darwin. <laughs> um, the concept of Darwinism teaches that all of the animals eventually evolved into human beings, which would put us on a... which would make us equal in a certain way. Since we came from them, we're just another animal. That's what Dar Darwinism ultimately teaches. Um, the Bible disagrees with that. We are not on the same level as any animal at all, including the chimpanzees, including the gorillas, including any other primate. So, Genesis 2, uh, 2, verse 21 and 25, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof, the first surgery, <laughs> and the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Did you know that the lower rib is the only bone in the body that will grow back if it's removed. I find that fascinating. Um, I have heard that it's not necessarily just the lower rib only. I've heard that if you properly remove any rib, I don't really know if that's true or not. Um, I didn't bother looking this up before I am making this video, but I, I believe that this is medically true. If you remove the lower rib, or maybe it's any rib, if you do it the right way, you can't just go in there and yank it out and whatever, you know, it uh, it has to be done through proper surgical uh, process, which is what God did here. God did it in a proper surgical way, and I'm pretty sure God is the perfect surgeon and he'll do it right. Okay, um, that the lower rib will grow back, which is not the usual thing that a bone will do. Okay, so that, that little tidbit of medical uh, truth just gives you a little more uh, veracity to the story of uh, Adam and Eve. It's the story of the Bible. Verse 24 will later be quoted by Jesus regarding a husband and wife being one flesh. Um which means that Jesus went back to Genesis 1 and 2 as being the beginning. Uh, and he took them as being literally true and not some sort of mythological way of getting a point across, which some people claim. Uh, one flesh. Here we now see the concept of nakedness for the first time. Without any knowledge of good and evil yet, both Adam and Eve had no reason to hide their nakedness. Nakedness will come to symbolize our fallen nature as sinners in the next chapter. Um, I could expand on this and probably make this video two or three times longer than it's going to be right now. Um, I don't know if it's possible for them to have procreated without the knowledge of being naked. And I don't want to go into a lot of details about that. I'm pretty sure any adult knows what I'm talking about. It kind of requires 
understanding nakedness to get into the act of creating a child. Now, this is something that none of us understand because none of us know what it was like to be Adam and Eve before they fell. That is a completely uh, unknowable uh, concept to any human being alive. But uh, that is the end of this chapter. Uh, they are naked and they were not ashamed. We will continue with the fall of mankind into sinfulness in the next video. Okay, so that is that for this. I hope you enjoyed uh, Genesis chapter 2 and uh, Genesis chapter 3 coming up. God bless you all.